My name is Marina and I'm an addict. My drug of choice was meth and alcohol. The first time I got high was with my sister and we drank and did some speed. I was 15 years old, I wanted to kind of be like her and you know, go out and have fun like she did. And so she took me out with her and her baby's dad. And we used meth and stuff and we partied like all night and it was kind of, it felt good at first. My addiction started getting like deeper, like I started using more like on a daily basis and stuff like that. I dropped out of high school at like 15 or 16 years old. I decided I wanted to go hang out and like, I guess you could say pretty much like, be like my sister, you know, go party and hang out with guys, you know, cholos and stuff like that. I looked up to my sister so I thought what she was doing was okay. At the age of 17, um, I got pregnant with my first kid. I had her nine months later and during my pregnancy, when I first got pregnant, I wasn't using, but then after that I started using, um, before I had her, I started using meth again because I was stressed out and I was like depressed and I was worried and my mom and my baby's dad didn't help the situation none. When I had my daughter, I lost her to CPS. Um, and that was like one of the hardest things in my life. Her grandma took care of her and I was going to court and doing classes for, for, um, for CPS or whatever. I decided that she was better off with her grandma and because I of course wanted to still party. I let her grandma keep her and I told the courts that I'd sign over my rights to her and that's what I did. During that time of me having my daughter and CPS, I got pregnant again with my son. And at this time, I was really into drugs and my baby's dad had hit me in front of a social worker and um, we called the cops on him and he went to jail. And I was pregnant and I had to tell the social worker I was pregnant and she was like, well, you know what's gonna happen when you have the baby is you're gonna lose the baby. So I decided to give my son up for adoption to a family, to a lady that couldn't have kids. I actually got clean to be able to give them a healthy baby boy. They took care of me, they paid my way, they got me an apartment, they did everything that they could, medical bills, all that stuff. I didn't have to pay for nothing. This happened like the last six months of my pregnancy. They actually got to take a healthy baby boy home without the baby being addicted to drugs, so that was pretty awesome, you know? The only reason why I think I did that was because they wanted a healthy baby boy and they were helping me out. Other than that, I don't think I would have been able to do it. The parents came to get them and that was actually really hard for me because I actually stood clean to have them for somebody else, so it kind of broke my heart. I got to spend the four days in the hospital with them. They asked me if I wanted to like spend time with him and I told them yeah, and I probably shouldn't have because when I left that hospital, the first thing I wanted to do was to go get high because I was like depressed and I was like, oh my God, you know, making that decision when you're 18 or 19 years old is like the hardest thing I think somebody has to do. But I did it for the right reasons. I, at least that's what I think, that's how I feel. So time went on and I was still using, I was still doing, you know, robbing, stealing, gang banging, doing stuff like all kinds of crazy stuff in the streets. And then I had another little girl, and I think by the grace of God that she came out of, she came out without being UA'd by the, the hospital and stuff like that, because if they would have UA'd me, they would have took her from me. And I got to bring her home with me, and it was amazing. Like, I got to actually raise her for a little while. And then her dad came to see her, and we ended up moving in together and getting a place together. And he was very abusive, and we both were using together, so, and when he drank, he got really abusive. So one day he went to hit me and threw a beer mug at me and it almost hit the baby. So the next day I left him with the baby. I took my daughter to a motel back to where I was staying in the first place when I first had her. He came and found me and he took my daughter from me and he took me to court and I lost my daughter again with another baby that I lost. He told the court all about my past history with my other kids and that I was using drugs and all that stuff. and. I refused to like tell on him and say that he was a bad father too because I'd rather have my kid at least with one of us. So I just let the judge decide what they were gonna do and they gave him custody of my daughter with me with visitations. I didn't get to see her for a long time until um, I had gotten pregnant with my twin boys. When I had my twins, he, the baby's dad was like, you're pregnant again? And I was like, yeah. 
So, again, I was trying not to use because I was pregnant with two babies instead of one, and I knew that this was going to be a hard pregnancy and a difficult pregnancy because I had two babies in my stomach. At the time, I didn't care about nothing or nobody, not even what was in my stomach, you know. Um, and I used through my pregnancy again, and I kept using, and this time I was getting worse and getting worse. And um, I started hanging around with the bad crowd, like the gang, gang members, and, and I was, like, deep in the, like, hanging with my homies and doing whatever, you know, they asked of me, whether it was selling drugs or, you know, robbing people or beating people up. It didn't matter to me. I did whatever, you know, to just, I guess, to be in the cool crowd kind of thing. That was, like, in my early 20s, so I was, like, a late bloomer. Being pregnant, I started prostituting myself. Um, I used to always talk shit to my sister about her prostituting herself. And I was pregnant with twins and I was selling my body on the street for drugs, for money, to put a roof over my head. Me and my twin's father had got into an argument and um, he didn't know what I was doing. And my sister um, seen me walk in the corner and she was like, I'm going to tell your baby's dad. And I was like, oh my God, dude. So. I wanted to tell him before she did, and I didn't know that, I guess, she kind of got there before I did and told him. So when I walked in there to talk to him and tell him what was going on and why, well, at least tell him why I thought I was doing it, he already knew about it. And, like, he cried, and, and I cried, and we both cried, and, and whatever. But it didn't solve the problem that I was already having. I was already selling my body, and I was already used to making easy money, so nothing was going to stop me. Even being pregnant didn't matter. He convinces me to stop doing what I'm doing so I don't, you know, hurt his babies, obviously, and we would try to work things out. So he started going to the doctors with me and stuff started getting a little bit better with our relationship, and, um, but we were still using together. Like, he didn't stop me from using because I was pregnant. Like, he didn't stop that. One day I was on my way. I had a doctor's appointment, and, of course, I got high before my doctor's appointment. I was in the shower getting dressed and I started having a pain in my stomach and it really scared me and I couldn't move. And I, I already knew because I already have a couple kids. So I was like, oh my God, I'm in labor. What am I going to do? Like, I have a doctor's appointment. I want to go to the doctors. I don't want to go to the hospital. And I screamed and I called him and I was like, I think I'm in labor. And he was like, you, he got scared because I was like seven and a half months. He's like, you can't be. And I said, you got to remember that these are twins. So they're probably going to come out early anyways. I was really, really scared, and my pain started going really, really bad, and I was like, you got to get me to the hospital, like, now. We got in the car, and he took me to the hospital, um, and he got a wheelchair, and they were trying to stop the contractions, I guess, or give me whatever pain medication or whatever they gave me to stop the contractions. So I guess in a disguise, that was a blessing, because if they wouldn't have gave me the medication that they gave me for the pain and stuff, they probably would have been able to drug test me, and I would have came out dirty anyways. So I got to take my twins home after they were in the hospital for like over a month or two. They were healthy, thank God, nothing was wrong with them. After I had them home for like a month or two, they started, because they're susceptible, they say, to like catching codes easy and getting sick easy because they're newborn. They both got put in the hospital and transferred to a children's hospital in California because they both had pneumonia. So I guess us smoking didn't help the situation. We smoked in the bathroom instead of you know, in the room with them. The social workers got called on me again. And at this time, my daughter's father was allowing my daughter to come and stay with me because she had two twin baby brothers and she wanted to meet them and see them. So at this point, my little girl was like four, maybe four or five years old, and she would come and spend the night, spend the weekend with me. He would let her so she can help me with her baby brothers. Um, so that was kind of cool, even though I still wasn't kind of doing the right thing. And social workers and police showed up at my door for my daughter, for my, for my twins. And they came and they took my twins from me. Now, they didn't know exactly that my daughter was my daughter, so they left her there with me. But she shouldn't have been with me either. So, you know, they actually came back like an hour or two later for her. But I had already dropped her off at her grandma's house because I knew they were coming back for her. I'm like, they're going to come back for her. Like, they're going to know that this is my daughter, you know. Took her back to her grandma's and that caused a big old CPS case for him. He lost my daughter and it, it was just, he had to go through a lot of stuff to get her back and he did, he did everything he was supposed to so he got her back. By that time I'm starting to go to jail for prostitution and I am have to do these AIDS tests and all these tests for jail and I get 
probation, not to spit. I, for some reason, I was like kind of like naive to jumping in cars because I'd jump in any car and I'd hop in some cop's car and not even know it until like they pulled us over. <laughs> and of course, I'd say whatever I was saying, like whatever this much. And as soon as I'd say this much and we turned the corner, there'd be like 10 cop cars right behind us. And I'm like, you're the cops. And you know, it was kind of funny. It's funny now. But it wasn't funny at the time, it's really scary, you know? During the time that I was prostituting and doing all that stuff, especially after I had my twins, I did it a lot more. I've gotten raped at gunpoint, I've gotten raped at knife point, I've gotten jumped, I've gotten robbed, I've gotten thrown out of cars. I like, I've gotten thrown out of the same car by the same person in two different cities. Not even knowing that it was the same person until after the second time that it happened, then I realized it was the same person. And to be honest, when you're out there in the streets, I mean, nothing's, nothing's changed. The cops honestly don't care because of what you're doing, you know, because I'm selling my body. They're like, whatever, you know, like kind of like you deserved it type of stuff. At one point in time, I got kidnapped and kept in a motel room for like almost 48 hours. And um, the guy that kidnapped me and like literally like used me as whatever, like, kept me handcuffed to his bed like I thought I was gonna die. And that still didn't stop me from like, to stop doing what I was doing. He turned out to be this crazy rapist that was, he unhandcuffed me to go and supposedly sign up for college, but in all reality, he was signing up, he was going to um, do his fingerprints at the LA Police Department downtown LA. And when he unhandcuffed me to let me to let me like use the bathroom and stuff while he was gone, um, when he left, I went downstairs and told the like receptionist that she had to call the cops because I've been in this person's room for like two days and he hasn't let me go. And so I was hysterically like freaking out. And um, they actually the only thing they did to that guy was because they he was downtown at the time that they called the thing in. The only thing they did to that guy was give him a violation of his probation. They didn't charge him with anything that he did to me because once again, I'm selling my body. So kind of it's like you get what you deserve type of thing, which is not cool, but that's how they look at it, I guess. I go and I decide, and this is really sad of me, but I just, I can't even tell you guys anything other than the truth is that I go and have three more kids. And till this day, I can't even remember what I named them. I don't know their ages. I don't know their birthdays. Like, drugs really, like, messed me up. In 2009, I'm from California, by the way. <laughs> and in 2009, I um, moved to Arizona to, um, to try and get clean, to live a different life. Um, I come out here with my baby's dad. Um, and we're both going to get sober, and we're going to do this the right way, and, you know, I can still have kids, so we're gonna start a family and we're gonna be out here and we're gonna be happy and drug free. And it works out like that for a little while and as soon as I get here, I get pregnant. And um, it doesn't really work out the way it's supposed to. Um, I end up losing my daughter. Um, and then I get pregnant again and I have my son in 2011. By this time I'm like, in the streets again. This time I'm in Arizona selling my body. Been raped twice out here. I've been robbed a couple of times and, and nothing still stops me. Like I still do whatever I do to get high or to make sure I have a roof over my head and a motel room to sleep at. And it's my little boy and I have him and I knew I was high and I knew I was gonna probably lose him. But I thought maybe because it was Arizona that they wouldn't pick my baby, like they don't know me, so why would they like UA me type of thing? But they did, and I actually didn't lose him because of drugs. I, I, I mean, I lost him because of drugs, but I didn't lose him because he was dirty. I lost him because I went to the hospital and I was high and I almost dropped him, so they drug tested me. I was dirty, of course. I lose him, baby's dad leaves me in Arizona. So now I have nothing or nobody in Arizona and I'm scared and I don't have nowhere to go. So I'm still doing the same thing, hustling and making money to make sure I have a roof over my head. And um, I catch a case in like 2012 or like late 2012. Um, and I go to jail and I get put on IPS. Um, 
it's intense probation. And um, I get put on IPS and I, um, I violate IPS like in three months. And I go to jail. They catch me after three weeks of me being on the run. I go to jail and I went to Perryville for like 10 months. And then when I got to Perryville, it was the scariest thing of my life. Like I've never been to prison before. It was my first experience and it wasn't what I like, or what a lot of people make it seem like it is. Like it's a walk in the park, it's really not. Even though I'm a female, female prisons are still like just as bad as male prisons. Um, the only difference is when I went in there, I went in there with a different mindset that like, I was determined when I got out of prison that I wasn't gonna be the same person. Um, I hit a couple of meetings in there. I wasn't really too fond of them, but like what they were saying in the meetings kind of stuck to my head. When I got out of prison, I did a halfway house. I got kicked out after the first month and then I went to a different halfway house. And when I went to this different halfway house, I was, um, I graduated, did my 90 days, I graduated, I got off of parole went to school to be a peer support, to be trained as a peer support specialist, I'm certified. I worked at the halfway house for like almost two years, like a year and like maybe six or seven months, or seven or eight months. I moved out of the halfway house. I work a 12-step program on a daily basis. And for myself, I believe in a higher power. I have sponsees, I have a sponsor, and I have people that I work with in the program and I have service commitments. And today I have an awesome job, and my sobriety date is July 16, 2013. November 30th of 2015, I started talking to my 15-year-old daughter, which I haven't seen since I was, since she was four or five years old, I think it is, like 10 or 11 years, which is February, I get to, at the end of February, I get to go see her for four days and meet her for the first time. So, like, things happen when you get sober. And I think that it's awesome. I'm a little nervous, but it's awesome.